That's good. So, well, Jared, I appreciate you uh, tuning in here for a little bit, and we're going to hop into the, the main presentation now, but uh, stay cool. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for um, for logging in here for this uh, Redux webinar on water management through inputs. Uh, we're really happy to have you. Uh, we're going to have a two-hour straight-through discussion kind of about um, water management and uh, how to read water reports and how to kind of how to go through uh, soil reports and we'll talk about soil health a little bit all with the goal of increasing uh, water use efficiency getting a stronger root system making sure that the water that we do put in the field does what we want it to do and that we um, can wisely approach our water inputs um, we appreciate vcalg for um, uh, in, uh, endorsing I guess this this with uh, two hours of credit uh, towards your uh, VCALIC certifications. And so we hope to bring you some useful information and then we'll end today with, um, as well, if you would like some CCA credits, we have two hours of CCA credits available for nutrition and water management, I think, or something like that. And, um, and then we'll also, yeah, we've got some, and we'll have some discussions on, on general input, um, general input decisions and things like that and different uh, water related and soil health related um, input decisions. So um, with that, I'd wanted to start through, uh, maybe tell you a little story before we jump into who is Redox while people, while people get logged on. And uh, so I, I, I took this picture a couple of years back, um, and this is a common issue in row crops, right? We need to get water down, or in any crop really, we need to get water deeply into the root zone, but in some, in some soil conditions, some water conditions, which we're gonna talk about at length today, it, it can be very challenging to get the water to move vertically in the soil and it ends up just sheeting off the surface. We get oversaturated topsoils and then we have runoff and sediment load. Regulators don't like that. And it's also expensive to run extra water and to have extra wear and tear on equipment and maintenance and things like that. So this grower um, had that issue, obviously. We, we can see that we've got a pretty decent um, flow there out the, out the ditch. And um, they actually had an issue where they had the drainage for the whole the whole property kind of had this this general issue and the drainage went kind of through one of their roads and they'd have to rebuild their road pretty significantly every time um, about once a week um, so we, we were able to come in here and kind of address some of the some of the some of the imbalances in the soil as well as um, do some do some work with their water and we were able to end up um, getting it so they were able to run shorter irrigation sets to get their water penetration down where they needed to and um, they said the best part of the whole thing was, well, yeah, we, we were accomplishing the water part before. It was just now we don't have to pay the guy to go out and fix the road, which is just phenomenal. So, um, so anyway, so that's that just kind of a fun story. Um, the only other one I'll, I'll throw up here is for you, you guys that, that have trees. We all know avocados are very salt sensitive. And I think hopefully today we can discuss a little bit about um, how to approach that from a water management and a um, looking at water reports and things like that to kind of help address so we don't end up in September with trees like this. So, um, and th there, there is some hope there, I guess. So, um, so with that, I wanted to jump into the agenda for today. Um, so we'll start with who is Redox um, and who we are that we're gonna be presenting, John and I. And then John will present on water chemistry for the first hour with some Q&A at the end. Um, and then soil and out, I'll, do, I'll jump in, we'll do look at soil reports and soil health and talk about that. And then we'll end off with some field experience rates and timings of products that we that we see working very well in the marketplace. And then um, discussion and FAQs to, to end off the whole thing. So um, some housekeeping details before we get going. Uh, uh, if you have a question, there's a uh, use your, you're welcome to ask questions throughout the, throughout the event. There's a chat option on your screen that you can use or a Q and A section um, that you're also welcome. We'll be monitoring both of those to try and uh, try and stay on top of things and make sure that we answer your questions as they come up. So please feel free to send, send in questions. We find them to be very beneficial to moving the discussion forward, making sure we're making sense. And then um, if you are on your mobile device, it seems that uh, you're, you can leave the app and the audio should continue playing just like speakerphone or something like that. So that's a nice thing. And then CCA credits will be available at the end, as I mentioned. So uh, with that, so the perp, I want to start off with who is Redox. So Redox exists to create passion, excitement, and growing plants. That's what we're here to do. We bring uh, value, value-added tools to the marketplace to help support your guys' business as well as your passion for growing, uh, growing crops and um, producing, producing ag product that feeds the world and makes it a greener place. Um, 
Redox really sticks to three core values, passionately authentic, creatively driven, and scientifically knowledgeable. We really try to drive the marketplace forward utilizing these three values and make sure that our, um, our product line as well as our, our, uh, our people um, stick, uh, can, can support these three values and, and bring value to you on the farm. Simply put, Redox is a bio-nutrient company that focuses on sustainable plant nutrition. So we'll talk today about that and the, uh, and I guess uh, sustainability is a, a nice hot word right now, but I think uh, the way I look at a sustainability is the ability for you as a farmer to, uh, to provide for your family and your customers in the long run, do it in an economically viable way, but also an environmentally friendly way and bring tools that, um, bring tools to the marketplace that allow you to do your job um, to the to the best of your abilities. So who am I? So I'm a, I'm Dr. Dan Klitich. I'm a redox agronomist. So I, uh, I got a PhD from uh, UC Davis uh, several years ago in entomology, looking at the interactions of fertility and um, and inputs for uh, uh, inputs. Sorry, fertility and pest populations. Um, born and raised here in Fillmore. That's where I'm coming from. You coming to you from today in my in my office here. Um, and I work as the regional agronomist for Redox covering the Central Coast from pretty much here um, up, to, up to Salinas. So I cover the majority of our coastal vegetable production region. Um, I'm gonna hand off here um, in a minute here to John Kelly. He will be doing the first half of this, of this presentation. And John is, a, is certified as both an advisor and sustainability specialist with American Society of Agronomy. He has worked with Redux Bionutrient for over 26 years, providing expertise and solutions for a variety of crops across the world. He's also one of the owners of Redox. So we appreciate him being on here today. And um, he has a, uh, a, very, a very deep grasp of water chemistry. Um, and we're really excited to have him here today to present on those topics. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so that he can pick up on sharing his screen. And I will hand it off to John. Okay. You hear me, Danny? Everything? You're good. Everything on the visual? Good shape? Yep. Everything looks great. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Glad to participate. And uh, fundamentals is a good word here. I hope we cover the the essentials of water chemistry. And and, and uh, my objective is is cover what what is basic to understand. Not getting not diving too deep. Um, in my presentation, I'll give you a little brief introduction. We'll talk briefly about abiotic stress, and then we'll get into water chemistry. We'll talk about soil chemistry, cations, amendments, anions. Uh, and Danny, when he introduced who Redox is, and he mentioned I've worked there for 26 years, I think the sustainability component of water chem chemistry is more important than ever. And I hope that that comes out and help, help us understand what we can do to mitigate um, the negative impacts on the environment. So Redox focuses on four key solution areas. Abiotic stress defense, which I'll, I'll discuss here in a moment, root development, yield and quality, and soil health. And I think what I'd like to start off by pointing out is water chemistry impacts each of these tremendously. So water, water chemistry, influences every as aspect of, of crop production. Let's talk a little bit about abiotic stress. Um, some research was done on a variety of crops and they found that as much as 70% of the yield potential of crops is impacted by abiotic stress. And what is, what is abiotic stress? That is the non-living factors um, on the plant and how it grows. In addition, most biotic stressors, so pests and pathogens, most of those are preceded by important abiotic stress points that create a plant more susceptible to damage, to economic loss. 
So as we look at this graphic and look at some of the commonly occurring abiotic stresses, heat, cold temperature, drought, watering, salinity, mineral deficiency, again, our irrigation, precipitation, water chemistry strongly influences all of these. So I, I, I hope just as a perspective as we, as we think about this and some concepts for improving um, our irrigation and uh, efficiency, improving um, and understanding what concepts can help us, hope we can keep this in mind. Well, let's start off with a, a permanent crop here. We have a, an almond orchard. And what do we have here? Well, we've got a drip system designed to precisely deliver water as well as fertigate nutrients uh, to that root zone. And if you look at the left photo, what do we see? Well, we see uh, that there is actually algae growing on the surface. Well, the, the algae loves an anaerobic uh, soil condition. So as we look at the right-hand photo, what do we have? We have a super saturated zone followed by a dry zone. So we're putting more water on here is not going to solve this challenge because we're not delivering water and any nutrients we apply to that root zone in a maximum way, the optimum way. In addition, with the absence of oxygen and that you know upper three to four inches, we severely diminish respiration of the plant as well nutrient availability. Well, this, this scenario right here with, with water that is not moving into the soil is strongly tied to the chemistry of that water. And we'll explain how and why in just a moment. Here we have, uh, have an orchard that's had serious quantities of precipitation. And of course, you can see that uh, we've got some tire sprayer tracks that have had to go through to get some early season applications on. And we have a, a, a different scenario where the, the ground is completely saturated. That in, and it also is a, is a challenge. And and is also influenced by the, the chemistry of the rain. This scenario, of course, is not uncommon at all where you can actually see uh, the salts that have precipitated out in a, an emitter on a drip system. And of course, we understand seeing this avocado tree, some of the negative impacts of, of salts. Well, with I, I hope these scenarios that I've, that I've put out here, we can have some, some good discussion, good presentation on understanding better how water chemistry influences these conditions, and more importantly, what can we do about them? So with that, let's dive into water chemistry. And I wanna point out something. We're not gonna cover everything about water chemistry, but if I, might, if I could be bold enough to say, we're gonna cover the essentials, the, the, the components of that water that you should understand, that, that if you understand or have a, a, a good grasp of these, you can not only understand a water report, but, but understand what, are the, what can I do about it, okay? So we'll cover pH, we'll cover what electroconductivity is, what soluble salts is, we'll cover the key cations, content of water, which typically are calcium, magnesium, and sodium. We'll cover bicarbonate. Here's the chemical annotation for bicarbonate. What is that? What does it do? We'll cover uh, sulfate content of water. Nitrate, nitrate nitrogen, a very important component. And then lastly, we'll talk about chloride. Now, there are other components to water. Uh, boron, there's there's the total dissolved solid, TDS. However, I will, I will emphasize, if you have a, a basic understanding of these components, how they affect um, water and the soil and the plant, I think, I think this will be very beneficial for us. We can't really <clears throat> talk a lot about water chemistry unless we bring the soil into the equation. 
Why is that? Well, as we look at the composition of the soil, let's talk about this and let's talk about how water chemistry influences that composition. Well, we have the mineral content, the sand, silt, and clay. Okay, we have organic matter, which in Western soils ranges from typically a half percent to some rare cases of 5%, but some areas of the country even have higher than that. That organic matter can be in various forms. It can be the it can be decomposed plant material. It can it can be um, undecomposed. It can be humus or or stable soil humus. And so organic matter is a key component. There's also pore space. And understanding pore space is actually very important. Because in a healthy soil, half of the volume of the soil, half of the volume of the soil is the mineral content and the organic content by volume. Half of that have content of the soil, it, again, in a healthy soil, is pore space. And if you look at the graphic on the, on the right hand side of the screen, pore space is divided into two categories. It's macro pore space and micro pore space. Now, what's the difference? Obviously, macro leads you to think about large, micro, small. But there's a very important difference in that macro pore space, the water enters the soil only drains by gravity. So it goes one direction. Another key component of the macro pore space is that is going to be the primary source of oxygen for the soil, for the plant, for the, for the microorganisms. As the water drains, it pulls in oxygen, and that oxygen create, enables there to be dissolved uh, oxygen in the micro pore space. Now, in the micro pore space, unlike the macro, it, the water direction movement moves by what we call capillary action. So it can move any direction it wants to, okay? The other important component of this, of this micropore space is that that is where the um, feeder roots reside. That's where nutrient and water uptake occurs. So in a, in a healthy scenario, whether precipitation or irrigation, we want to fill the profile. You want the macro pore space to drain relatively quickly, pulling in that oxygen. And that, so that 50% of the soil by volume, about half of that will be full of moisture, about half of that will be full of air, okay? The next thing in the soil, of course, is nutrient, nutrients and chemicals. Now, in most soils, that is only going to represent about 0.3 to 0.5% of the total soil composition. So all nutrients and chemicals combined are a relatively small uh, component of that soil. What's amazing to understand is that we looked at, at soluble nutrients or nutrients in a form the plant can actually assimilate. That is typically less than 0.01%. So a very small, component of that soil by, by volume is actually plant available nutrients. And the strongest, the strongest influence on the chemical composition of that soil is going to be moisture, water. And that can be precipitation or irrigation water or a combination of both. So think about this on a on a if we're if we're in the in the West and you're considering uh, a crop cropping system where you use three acre feet of water, which is not uncommon. That's over 8 million pounds of inputs with that three acre feet. So over 8 million pounds. So it's, it's natural that, that the, the chemistry of that water is going to strongly influence the chemistry of that soil. Likewise, if, if precipitation is high, such as if, if Northern California versus Southern California, or in areas of the country that are, you know, where you get several acre feet of, of precipitation. That also influences that soil chemistry in that 
in that that water absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it comes down, and that that form that forms uh, carbonic acid, which strongly influences the chemistry of that soil. Okay. Last but not least, there is, is the microorganism content. Now, strictly speaking, that microorganism content is a is a subcategory of organic matter. But that but the microorganism activity, as as we're learning more and more, has such a strong influence on the production potential and of of crops that understanding how how the water chemistry influences air water relationships and general chemistry in general is is extremely important okay so now with a with a background a little perspective on uh, soil composition let's talk about soil reports there are there are all there are a number of labs do an excellent job uh, with water analysis and more and more which is very helpful they not only give us the the numbers the figures they provide some graphics that kind of give us a perspective on on the, those um, on the the parameters and where we're at now I mentioned that that the um, water chemistry strongly influences the soil chemistry this happens to be from the south central coast and it, just a little perspective here, this, this is a water that has an electric conductivity, and I'll explain what that means in a moment, of 2.86. Well, typically you get above one, you're really starting to focus on what is the composition of that water. Just to give you an idea, this, this water, applying three acre feet per year, you're literally putting out 15,000 pounds of salts per acre. Now, some of those salts are good, some are not. But understand, particularly if this is going through a controlled irrigation system, that is a very, very high concentration of salts. And, and that the, the soil chemistry can be influenced very quickly. Okay. Here's another uh, soil analysis, or excuse me, water analysis. And in this case, this is a report prepared by Redox. Now, Redox does not operate a laboratory. We just take, we take data and offer some perspective. And we'll use, this, uh, we'll use this format to just kind of walk through a water analysis and what these, the, the figures mean. Okay, first of all, let's talk about um, pH. Uh, I think all of us, myself included, you look at a water analysis or a soil analysis, we are immediately drawn to pH. Well, is pH important? Yes. It is a relative measure of acidity or basicity. But I also want to point out that the content of what's driving that pH is more important than the pH itself. So this, this uh, water has a pH that's near, nearly neutral, 7.2. Uh, yet, as, as we discussed this, there are actually some, some um, potential issues with this with water that we should be aware of. On, in contrast, I often see water chemistry where the pH is in the mid eights. You think, oh, well, that's, well, sometimes, sometimes what's driving that alkalinity is actually not a significant quantity of salts. So keep in mind the pH, yes, it is a reflection of what is, that, what is in that water, but a water that's neutral or a water that's more alkaline, we need to dive a little bit deeper, okay? All right, the next thing we wanna look at on a water analysis is the EC. EC stands for electroconductivity. So when, it, when the number is expressed as a single digit, such in this case of 1.08, it is referred to as electroconductivity, which is a measure of elements that conduct electricity. This is a very important parameter. Uh, to be aware of one is 
liposoluble salts. So you can, you can convert one to another. If by chance you have um, um, the next about the cation position of and what you'll find is where we also magnesium and sodium chemistry is such that the, it, it tends to penetrate the, the now we have used to this where we look at this calcium magnesium and sodium and I should I should point out that most agronomic most ag analysis for of water will express th these elements in milliequivalents per liter or they could be in parts per million or both but when you're comparing elements just understand that milliequivalents per liter must be used when we look at these ratios because that accounts for the atomic weight, the equivalent weight of these, of these elements. So when calcium is expressed in milliequivalents per liter and magnesium, we're kind of comparing apples to apples, okay? That's another discussion we don't need to dive into too, deep, too deeply, just to understand when you're comparing, you always want to be comparing milliequivalents per liter. John? John, yes, we, had some, we had a rough connection there for a minute. Could you jump back to the end of your, um, to the, um, to, uh, yeah, that just, just EC, the end, just kind of the tail end of EC. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, um, thanks for letting me know. So electric conductivity, um, if it's, if it's a single digit, it's, it's EC. If it is parts per million, that will be soluble salts. And, and 650 parts per million soluble salts is the same as an EC of one. So just so you're aware of that. And electroconductivity is, uh, is an important, like pH, we want to know what's driving that. But EC is a, is a very important uh, basic understanding because as it gets, becomes one or higher, that means we're, we're putting out a significant amount of salts with that water and we want to understand the composition. Okay. Danny, is that kind of seem like we're, we're back where we're back. we need we're to good. be? Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. All right. Then let's talk about um, the cations. Cations are elements that have a positive charge. And the cation ratio of water is a very important metric for understanding how well the water will actually penetrate in the ground. It turns out that waters that have a higher ratio of calcium versus magnesium and sodium, and it's really best if it's two to one, have better penetration characteristics. So if you have a, a well water that happens to have a, a good amount of calcium, you'll find the ground takes it pretty well. Uh, this helps explain where you have like on the eastern slope of the San Joaquin Valley where you're getting snow melt, why that water tends to seal the ground off very quickly. There's just nothing in it. And so you, you, it's very, very pure and it tends to initially strip some of the calcium in, in that soil and it tends to seal off very quickly. So this, this ratio can apply both to a water with, with very high salinity or very, very low. So one thing I want to point out, this is probably what you missed when my internet was interrupted, was to compare elements to one another. They must be expressed in milliequivalents per liter, which most agronomic water analysis reports will do that. Some will express in parts per million and milliequivalents per liter, but milliequivalents per liter accounts for the atomic weight, the equivalent weight of the different elements. So you're you're making a fair comparison. Okay, so this is a this is actually a very important uh, parameter to to look at because when that when that um, when that ratio um, 
is um, is out of whack, that's that you can be you can be assured that's the that's the water. It's going to seal the ground up. It's, it's not going to it's not going to penetrate very well. Okay. All right. So with that, let's let's talk about an input that can influence that cation ratio. So let's talk about gypsum. Uh, so gypsum, of course, is calcium sulfate. It's a mineral composed of calcium sulfate dihydrate. And there's the formula for that. And at 95% pure material, it typically has 20% calcium and 15% sulfate sulfur. Now, one thing to understand about gypsum um, is that it must be calcium sulfate dihydrate for optimum solubility. Uh, just to understand if it's calcium sulfate, if it's if it's um, if it's not dihydrate, if it doesn't have two water molecules, that's essentially how you make wallboard, a very insoluble. You drive off that that water molecule. So you want to ensure when you get a source of material, make sure that it is in the dihydrate has been analyzed. And solubility, assuming that it's that it's calcium sulfate dihydrate instead of anhydrite. Um, solubility is a factor of purity and particle size, okay? Uh, purity, obviously, the higher the better. The particle size, really any measure finer is where that curve of, of solubility increases tremendously. Now, understanding gyp gypsum and how it works, it is considering purity, particle size, proper chemical formulation, it is technically soluble. But just understand that it is not very soluble. And that's okay, because we're gonna we're gonna explain how it works. But if we had laboratory conditions, we might be able to get 15 milliquilts per liter of calcium or, or 300 parts per million, it's the same thing, to, to dissolve in some deionized water. So if we took a hundred gallons a very pure water, agitation, everything perfect, we actually could only dissolve about 1.2 pounds of calcium sulfate in that water. So it's technically soluble, just not very, all right? Well, there's a number of benefits of calcium sulfate, or first of all, the sulfate, sulfur that comes from that is important for sulfur nutrition. Sulfur is required uh, formation of a couple L amino acids, so for nitrogen utilization, very important. Uh, from a water chemistry standpoint, the, the way gypsum works, and you, you know, for years, for decades, we've been taught, well, if you're gonna apply gypsum, keep it on the surface. Um, and there's a reason behind that, because the way it works is it alters the cation ratio of that water. So if you apply it to the, the surface, and you irrigate or get precip precipitation, you, you bump up the calcium, it dissolves slowly, but it changes that ratio, and that can dramatically improve water movement, penetration, and water air ratios. In contrast, if you, if you were to use solution grade gypsum and apply it into irrigation systems on a, on a continual basis, the same thing applies. You're simply changing that cation ratio and boom the water moves into the ground better. So that's how it works. So it does not, in, in this case, does not require a tremendous solubility to change that ratio. So it helps that, that ultimately we're managing salts. We're, we're, we're improving leaching. And what we're trying with through hydraulic action. So if you have sodium, you gotta, move, you gotta have that hydraulic action to move that, that sodium out or chloride. Um, or even hydrogen, although the calcium sulfate does not directly react with hydrogen like, like lime will, we'll talk about in a minute. The, the process of leaching, actually you can, you can get rid of some excess hydrogen that way. So calcium sulfate, understanding where it can fit and how it can benefit you is, is very important. Which brings up, where would it not be beneficial? Well, it, it won't be beneficial where we are not able to adequately, adequately alter this ratio. 
So if the water is very, very high in salts and we apply solution grade dips or apply to the soil, it may not change that ratio enough to make a dramatic impact. Now, one of the one of the positive things of gypsum is it's rarely it rarely provides a negative reaction um, because of the relatively low solubility. It it does it's not often that it causes problems, but in some cases that is not going to be our best choice because it just can't it's not capable under the chemical conditions to change those ratios. Okay, now. This one is just for you to take a screenshot or look at the presentation later. All I'm doing is I'm providing the formula of how you would determine how much solution grade gypsum you need to apply. So I have a scenario here where that to change the calcium to magnesium plus sodium ratio, we determine we need to raise calcium in that water by 1.25 milliequivalents per liter. We run that calculation. That means 25 parts per million. We run that. That's 202 pounds of, of calcium that is required for three acre feet of water, or per acre foot of water, for, excuse me, for three acre feet of water. And then we determine here at the bottom, well, if I put out roughly 1,000 pounds of solution grade gypsum, frequently, if not every irrigation during the season, I'm, you're going to successfully alter that that cat that cation imbalance and have a very high likelihood of success. Okay. All right. Now let's turn our attention to bicarbonate. Okay. Now you've heard carbonates, bicarbonate. I hope to clarify that. First of all, carbonate, we're not going to talk about carbonate content specifically in water because it's very rare. How a bicarbonate is quite common. So bicarbonate drives alkalinity. Alkalinity ultimately is the accumulation of hydroxyl ions in, in the soil. And I, I state here that levels above 2.5 milliequivalents per liter may justify some water treatment or, or looking at treating that water. Now, why above that and not below that? Well, the reason being is. You've, you've all done this where you're looking to buffer the pH of a spray tank because the insecticide you're applying says, you know, make sure your, your pH is between 5 and 8, 5.5 5 .5 and 6. So you put buffering agents into that tank. You start it off at 7.5. It is not a straight line. What happens, you buffer and buffer, and what happens? It drops very, very quickly. Well, the same thing can apply if you're applying sulfuric acid in your irrigation system. You, you, can, you can modify that water, and we'll explain that process, but you can quickly, if you go too far, literally destroy your irrigation system and, and potentially even cause damage to your crop. So, so there's the technicians that help set up these rigs are very careful to leave a certain quantity of, of buffering capacity and bicarbonate in the water. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, bicarbonate, how how it what it does, how it works, and so on. I, this is this is important to to understand. So first of all, the chemical annotation for bicarbonate is HCl3, and I omitted the negative charge there. So it has a negative charge. Now visualize whether your water is coming from a ditch, coming out of a well. Um, either way, that water comes to your farm in uh, relative equilibrium, okay? So, so there's, there's not a lot of reaction going on as it comes in, because it, reactions have already occurred. However, bicarbonate in particular, through the process of evaporation, what happens is there becomes a higher concentration of salts. So the negatively charged bicarbonate has a strong affinity or attraction to elements with a positive charge, cations. A good example is calcium. What happens when the calcium with two positive charges, bicarbonate with a negative charge, it precipitates out and, and causes a reaction 
forming lime or calcium carbonate. And what happens here is this calcium carbonate now is a, an insoluble compound in that soil. And that could, that, that could be on the, your the emitter of your irrigation system. It could be on the surface of the soil. That process, wherever that evaporation occurs, that, that can happen. Well, that reaction, of course, can happen with iron and zinc and magnesium and other cations. And what's happening is as that reaction occurs, you take what could be plant available elements and they're being tied up in these insoluble compounds. Now, the good news is we can reverse that process and we'll talk about that in a moment. So that's why, that's why bicarbonate is a, a key factor in, in the water chemistry, okay? Another one to, to consider is, is sulfate. And keep in mind uh, a couple things. Well, sulfate, of course, is a, nu a nutrient. We just talked about how important that is for nitrogen utilization and amino acid production. But L sulfate, sulfur, SO4, negative charge has in excess, can, can not as, not nearly to the degree of bicarbonate, but we can actually start, it, it can start inducing undesirable reactions in the soils. That concentration is high. And note, note that most water reports will express it as sulfate. To express it as sulfate sulfur or the nutritional form, you just multiply it by 0.33. Now, this, this is important to understand because if, if sulfate sulfur, especially on deeper wells, is, is at a level that is excessive, in this case, we're accumulating 29 pounds of sulfate or 10 pounds of sulfate sulfur for every acre inch of water. A, a very strong consideration should be is where is the relative sulfur levels, sulfate sulfur levels in my soil? Because this, this water here, from a bicarbonate standpoint, we have 5.16. But some case, in some cases, we don't want to add fuel to the fire because we're already, we're already applying so much sulfate sulfur that if we're going to treat the water with sulfuric acid, we're going to have an additional accumu accumulation. So sometimes the cure is worse than worse than the or the, the the remedy is worse than the cure. So so keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So let's let's talk about if what happens in water if you're going to treat that water to to neutralize some of that bicarbonate. Well, here's our bicarbonate. Here's the sulfuric acid. You 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 know a company or service is going to provide that that uh, the titration to get the right quantity out there and what you have is the ultimately that sulfuric acid bicarbonate you end up with water and sulfate sulfur and again where this is beneficial where this fits if if this is a fit for your operation it, there are rarely um there rarely budget dollars that could be spent uh, wiser where this is the proper fit. It, it has a tremendous benefit where it is properly recommended. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, an acid reaction where we have carbonates in the soil already. All right. So here's lime or calcium carbonate. And of course that was, that was far, uh, formed as a precipitant of calcium in the presence of bicarbonate, or, or it could be caliche that was been in the soil for millennia. You have this line. Okay, you take sulfuric acid or an acid forming material, and what do you end up with? Well, in this case, the outcome of the, of the sulfuric acid reacting with that carbonate is you get calcium sulfate, that's gypsum carbon dioxide, CO2, and water. Again, where appropriate, where, where excessive carbonates in that soil are a limiting factor for nutrient availability, for water movement, there's rarely an input that is more dramatic. But again, understand your water chemistry, how that, how that is, is um, 
affecting your soil chemistry to determine where this is going to be most appropriate. So again, you know, who, who can't use soluble calcium, carbon dioxide, and water? So it's a, it's a very beneficial reaction if it's appropriate for your, for your situation, okay? So with that, let's just talk about, just to, just to clarify some of the difference, what is ele elemental sulfur? Well, elemental sulfur can occur naturally, but most of this sulfur used in agriculture is a byproduct of, of industry, okay? Uh, it, most cases, they're, they're removing it from natural gas and petroleum, and it's, it's used to make sulfuric acid. Uh, it's used to make various uh, fertilizers. Um, you, you need, you need uh, phosphoric acid to make virtually all phosphate-based uh, fertilizers. That phosphoric acid is a reaction between sulfuric acid and uh, rock phosphate or calcium phosphate. Okay, so one thing I want to point out is the, the, the chemical annotation for sulfur is just S. But S, sulfur by itself, is actually inert in this form. It doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything because it has to be reacted. And in the soil, there's a specific type, type of uh, species of organism called phyllobacillus that actually consumes the sulfur and creates sulfuric acid. So, so you apply sulfur and the same thing applies like gypsum, purity and particle size are gonna be a lot more reactive. This microorganism consumes it, produces sulfuric acid, here's your lime, and then you get that same outcome as if you were applying sulfuric acid. Okay. Well, in this discussion, um, Danny suggested I, I just clarify where lime fits into this equation. Now, first of all, lime is, is not going to have any type of direct impact on the water chemistry itself, but it does play a key role in soil chemistry or in, in where it's appropriate, uh, we'll discuss in a moment here. So, so lime is typically mined, it's calcium carbonate, and again, the purity and particle size are going to create the maximum reactivity. And just a reminder of, of where lime fits in, let's talk about calcium for a moment. Calcium of the key cations in the soil, which are going to be calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and in some cases hydrogen. Calcium is unique because of its valence, and, and its uh, size, the specific atomic weight, it performs a key role of flocculating that soil. The, the two positive charges can attach to one soil colloid to another, pull those together. That creates essentially better quality and quantity of the micropore space that we talked about earlier. So you have more potential root zone. Well, what, what can happen in soils is other cations in place of calcium can dominate these soil colloid sites. So it can be it can be excessive magnesium in this case. And when you have a high, those of you that have high magnesium soils, you know how sticky they can be, how difficult it can be to get water to move well. You know how how those soils tend to, when they dry out, they just turn into a, a, literally a brick, the soils crack. Well Likewise, sodium can have a very negative impact. So, sodium, if it's there in, 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 at the expense of calcium, yeah, sodium is a monovalent cation that only attaches to one sole colloid. So it causes deflocculations, seals up, that, seals up that ground, inhibits the water movement, and of course, air movement along with that. Hydrogen as well. Hydrogen is it monovalent cation? Is it occupies those soil colloids? It, that soil, that, that the relative capacity fertility of that soil diminishes. And that's where lime comes in. Because, because liming is calcium carbonate, which is the, the, the byproduct of what we talked about of lime a few minutes ago. But where you have excess hydrogen, there, 
so your pH is too low, too much hydrogen. Again, there is nothing you can do that even remotely uh, comes close to improving the soil potential for crops than liming properly. It has such a tremendous benefit. So here we have two polar opposites. When we have too many carbonates and we apply sulfur or acid forming or acid materials, or where we have too much hydrogen, we apply lime. Both of those have a profound impact on the performance of that soil. Why? Because it goes fundamentally to the soil structure, how air and water can move in that soil. Okay, let's turn our, our discussion right now to soil surfactants. Um, now, soil surfactants, in, in, in a certain regard, polymers can fall into this category as well. Essentially, the mode of action is breaking the surface tension of water. Some surfactants have additional benefits, but what do we mean by breaking the surface tension of water? Well, water, the water molecule, they're, they're strongly attracted to one another, you have a, and they, they want to pull together. So think of a, if you put water on, the, on your desk, what do they do? They bead together. Well, the same thing occurs in the soil. And what, what happens is that water wants to kind of take the path of least resistance. And so what often occurs is we readily fill the macropore space, but our micropore space, where all of our nutrient and root activities occurring, uh, is dry. So what a surfactant can do is to effectively help us hydrate that zone, help move that water better. And so the surfactant technology is, it can, can be a very important tool, especially if some of these other concepts or other practices we've talked about are not viable options. It can be a very effective for helping with water management. Okay, uh, chloride, uh, the primary impact of chloride is if it's allowed to accumulate in that root zone, it's not continually moving or leaching through. Chloride, of course, uh, has a very negative impact on nutrition and can cause a lot of phyto phytotoxicity in the crop. Uh, a brief discussion of nitrate nitrogen is in order. Uh, nitrate nitrogen uh, is in a nitrogen management plan, you need to account for the nitrate coming from, from your, uh, your water source. Okay, if we if we ran the math on this one here, uh, you know we're only getting uh, a quarter quarter pound of nitrogen per acre inch. So this one's at 1.1. 1 .1, so it's a it's a nominal amount, not enough to worry about. But as you as you get above five, you really need to monitor that and just understand from a drinking water standpoint that nitrate nitrogen. The, the threshold is from a, from a quality standpoint for human consumption above, time, above 10 is not advised. And I want to point out that a, a water analysis agronomically typically expresses nitrate nitrogen in a uh, one that's used for, for measuring chemistry for, for human or culinary consumption is usually expressed as nitrate. And so that, that figure is actually going to be 44 parts per million. Okay. So it's the same thing. You just, the nitrate nitrogen, you're not, you're not including the oxygen then in that. So let's talk about nitrate. Well, nitrate, nitrate, nitrogen has a negative charge. So there's a soil, so it doesn't attract or hold. So it tends to leach very readily. And that's one of the biggest causes concerns is nitrate leaching into the into the water supply and uh, the, the relative impact on human uh, environmental health okay um, I will tell you that while the your nitrogen plans this was this was brought up in the uh, if you if any of you attended the the nitrogen seminars that have been presented in California you'll understand that is brought up that a unit of nitrate nitrogen coming from your water is really not the same as fertilizing because it's so, so dilute. But 
with that in mind, we still have to account for them. From an environmental standpoint, uh, while nitrate nitrogen tends to leach, one of the challenges, with, of course, with phosphorus is it tends to stay on the surface, subject to surface runoff. But either of these, as they get into the water supply, causes eutrophication, which is a depletion of oxygen. It promotes a, a, aquatic plant life as those plants grow, die, decompose. Microorganisms that decompose there are going to they're going to steal oxygen out of that water and you get a depletion there. It's, it's a very important issue. You've heard of the algae blooms, you've heard of the dead zone in, the, in various areas of the world. Just, just without getting too de deep into this, a, a Sierra Nevada beautiful mountain stream will have six parts per million dissolved oxygen. The dead zone in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico has two. So it's really a subtle difference. That create that kills fish and, and changes the uh, plant life there. Well, with with that, I just want to point out that that from a soil health standpoint, th this discussion of water chemistry and management practices all come back to this soil health uh, concept. And at Redox, we believe soil health. You need to look at the chemistry, the biology, and the physiology. And of course, the chemistry is going to be influenced by our water, and that chemistry is going to strongly influence the biology, and it's going to influence how roots grow. And with that, Danny, I I will take questions, or we can delay them to them, whatever you prefer. I think let's take a little break for questions. Look at that, John, right on the dot, 12 o'clock. That was amazing. Um, yeah, let, let's... Um, Let's take some questions here. We'll stop, stop, stop sharing. Um, yeah. So, does anybody have any questions they want to pop into the chat window? Please go ahead. I've got one here that we get really often, especially here on the coast, is that you know our, as you can see on our on our um, that soil, the water report that we that that you had there, the sulfate numbers generally are fairly high in a lot of our wells. Chlorides are high, um, and overall EC can be can be fairly high. Um, so, I mean, we talked at length about gypsum, I guess, and uh, our experience has been when you run the math, the gypsum number is quite high to make a measurable change in kind of that calcium to magnesium sodium ratio, especially the further we get in or the poorer our water quality gets. I guess, do you have any comments on that? Yes. Um, like I probably mentioned a half dozen times with various practices, where gypsum is agronomically appropriate, it's fantastic. Where it's, where it's recommended properly, it's a, it's a proper fit. It is a solid input with a solid benefit. I think, however, some of these inputs, and I could say the same thing about acid, I could say same thing about you know, other practices. I think sometimes, because in some situations it's such a strong tool, it's often put in a situation which it just can't work. So I, I often talk to consultants and growers and say, you know, I've got a salt problem, but I put gypsum out, it's just, I don't know, it's not helping. Well, if it's not helping, it's because it, it is, in that situation, it's unable to change that ratio adequately to get that leaching component to your water. And I should mention, Danny and I both, the rest of the Redox team, we, we love looking at water and soil report so you know we're we're always open to if you if you care to have our take on any given situation we'd be happy to uh, share that okay um let's see any other questions come in here um the other one we usually get is especially in a lot of the berry crops which we have represented here calcium nitrate input cn9 can 17 um, are definitely the go-tos for our nitrogen inputs. So um, when we when we add those, we're obviously putting in a decent amount of calcium also. So do you see that influencing kind of the the water management strategies or the water quality issues? That's an excellent question. Um, the the calcium component uh, and nitrogen component of CN9 uh, CAN17. Um, one of the problems is so it's it's a it's a very beneficial fertilizer. It's readily available. It's 
there's, there's nothing wrong from a nutrient standpoint, but if we attempt to use those materials to alter water or salt soil chemistry, we're typically putting out more nitrogen than the crop is capable of utilizing and or could be enough nitrogen that we're actually causing the excess nitrate accumulation in the vacuole of the cells. So, so those should not be utilized as water amendment and or soil member, use them to feed the plant. Great. Um, I, I think the last one I've got here is that we get, as is another common frequent last question, I guess, is there can be hundreds of pounds of calcium already in the water. So sometimes it seems, uh, excessive, I guess, to try and add more calcium to move that number along, um, especially, you know, if we have high, high, high bicarbonate and things like that. So, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of a leading question that we're looking at probably kind of more so while going that surfactant direction. And maybe I just answered my own question, but I think that's, that's one I had on here that I just wanted to kind of push out. The last one. So we did, we, you did, you did mention kind of maybe, maybe, maybe a pros and cons of, sulfuric acid, sulfur burner, CO2 machine, kind of soil acidification technologies or water acidification technologies? Uh, sure. Well, it, it, as I mentioned, where, where it is appropriate and agronomically uh, a solid input, there's rarely, uh, there's rarely a better utilization of budget dollar. It can be really, really fantastic. Um, but, of course, you want to use it where it's appropriate, and that it that has everything to do with your specific water chemistry and soil chemistry. Okay. So you don't you don't want to you don't want to use that, and um, actually have a, have a detriment because it's it's a condition where it's not appropriate. So it's more so the technologies when each of those is used appropriately. It's really the they, they all work fine and have the same end, the same end goal. It's more so making sure that when we employ one of those, that we are trying to address a high bicarbonate issue and not just doing it because our pH number says 7.4 and we wanted it at 6.7. Yeah. Is that accurate? That, that's correct. Okay, good. I get those mixed up sometimes too. So I just appreciate the, the, um, the input there. So, um, I think that's it that I'm going to, that I, that I have questions here. I don't have any others trickling in here. So I will, um, feel free to continue to come up with those. We will, um, have another, uh, question section here at the end. So, um, I will get my screen going again here and we will start talking about soil health. There we go. Make sure I got my things going. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about, so we're gonna kind of switch from the, from the liquid here into the soil. So we're gonna go from the water to the soil and because um, that obviously plays a large role in our, um, in our cropping systems and it's another one of those analytical reports that we get um, quite often that I think gets uh, tossed into the filing cabinet and ignored and sometimes rightfully so and sometimes there's some information on there that needs to be um, addressed or at least or at least taken taken into account when we're making our management decisions. So let's jump into soil reports and um, and talk about it. Now the first thing, so here's a, a sample soil report. This is the redox formatted one, similar to the water analysis. We have a uh, we have data that's inputted and 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 uh, analyzed through our system. It spits out this um, this soil analysis. So um, I think the first thing I want to highlight, and we're going to go through several different aspects as John did in the water report, but go through it here on the soil report. But something I wanted to say here, just to start off, is this is not a report card. So a lot of people look at these um, soil reports as, um, as something that um, is maybe flexible and influenceable. And I think that's maybe the wrong way to look at these um, and maybe look at these more as a representation of the situation you have. And there are some things on here that are dynamic over time, but most of these things are pretty well set, um, literally in stone, because that's what our soils are originally derived from. So, um, for example, we'll we'll get into the things that can change and that can and that can be changed. But for the most part, a soil report is a representation of the soil situation you have, and um, it's it's really should be used to inform your management decisions. 
um, so that they're done. Uh, they're done. Your management decisions are done being in, are being informed from the conditions that you have. So I have a an, uh, this is a soil report here from Ventura County out of kind of an odd soil that has a lot of different issues. So we'll have a good time kind of reviewing it and going through the different aspects. So let's jump right in here. So let's zoom in a little bit. So first thing, CEC the, is um, is the cation exchange capacity of our soil. That is a metric of you can think of how much nutrition or salts we can hold in that soil. So the higher that number, the more nutrition or salts we can hold in the, in the soil. And that, that also correlates to the more clay that's in that soil for the, for the generality. So the higher that number, we think of them as the heavier the soil, right? So a 38.6 is a very high number for Ventura County. This is a very heavy clay out on one of the hilltops here in Ventura County. And um, if you had a, you know, you think a beach sand, that's a CC of about 0.5. Most of our sandy loams and clay loams that we have across uh, the, the Oxnard Plains are in that 18 to 24 range is kind of where those are. So it kind of gives you an idea of what your general characteristic of your soil is. The next one we have here is organic matter. Organic matter, as John mentioned, is in his, uh, in his review of soils, is the amount of carbon that's held in that soil and that is um, the way this is reported is all of the organic matter is anything that can be burned out of your soil so that's how they get this they they burn they literally put your oil or your soil in an oven and burn it and then they measure the weight difference your dried soil versus your dried burned soil and that gives you the percent organic matter of how much carbon they were able to burn out of your soil so it really is a total carbon in your soil that um, that is measurable. So that is what the organic matter is. This really, this indicator, um, when it's very low, can be very informative. When it's very high, such in this case, this was an avocado block, and it's pretty common for us to see these um, high organic matter levels when we're pulling soil samples out of um, leaf litter duff areas, even when we try, even when we remove the majority of that leaf litter, there's still a pretty decent amount of organic matter, especially in high CEC soils. Um, so let's keep going here. pH, John did a great description here on pH and soil pH is very similar to our water pH. Um, the biggest difference however is it's very hard to change our soil pH in a meaningful way. So once again coming back to um, we can move this number around a little bit with our water input um, but we'll talk a little bit later about some examples in blueberry production where um, it was attempted to move that soil pH down to where Michigan blueberries might might be growing in more of that low six range at six six point zero, even in the high fives, and that can have drastic influences on the overall chemistry in a negative way of our soils due to our methods that we're using to um, to to achieve that. And then the soil has the ability to re to reequilibrate over time, and it will always be trying to do that. So you'll be in a constant battle to try and for this against the soil for it to try and it wants to be at this at this level. Okay, so that's pH. Soluble or soil solution weight is a uh, is a fun number. So this is the amount of water your soil can hold while in at field capacity. So field capacity is defined by the amount of or is is, is when water is only held in the micropore space. So it has drained out. You're not counting the puddles, but it is all the water that's 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 that that water that that soil can hold and this comes in importance when you're doing some calculations on nutrient availability and nutrient uh, how much nutrients are held in the water and things like that but we're not going to get too much into that but it's kind of a fun number and that's in pounds so it's kind of a fun number to think that you have a quarter million pounds of water sitting out there in your in your field at this with this soil and the last one is soluble salts that's ec similar to our water ec um, it's actually measured very similarly and um, so it's our overall soluble salts electroconductivity in the soil. So those are just some general metrics that are mostly found on most soil reports and can have some basic inputs on how we, how we uh, interpret them. Um, the next one we have is found on a lot of different soil reports and it's reported differently um, on from different companies that do soil reports, but um, chemical extract versus paste extract. And there's several different types of chemical extract and there's several different types of paste extract. We're not gonna delve into that today. Just the difference that you should know in between the two is that um, a chemical extract is done with some type of acid or other chemical to help extract nutrition out of the soil. And the goal here is to show what the soil has that conceivably could be related to 
um, that could be related overall to the accessible nutrition for that plant. I have a question here from Paul that asks, soil solution weight is expressed per acre? Uh, correct. Yes, that's per six inches, I believe. John, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, so no, no, you're correct. So six inches by an acre. Six the weight, inches. Weight of the water. In pounds. As you said, by field capacity. Okay, thank you. And, um, and then our paste extraction, and there's a couple different paste extractions, but is generally done with DI water or some type of, uh, some type of fairly clean water. And that's more so representing what's immediately available to the plant and as overall, um, I always forget to click this button, sorry. Um, but is overall available um, for, the, for, the, uh, for the plant to immediately have. And then the last section here is our base saturation. These show up on any, this is, this is probably one of the most informative parts of our soil sample and shows up on pretty much every soil, soil sample that, that does measure the majority of the cations. Um, and that is our base saturation. So base saturation tells us the proportion of our chemically extracted um, cations. So I said a lot of big words there. So that's the percentage of all of our calcium, magnesium, sodium, and the ratio they are to each other coming out of this chemical extract. Now, the reason we care about base saturation is this really informs kind of overall how our soil is going to take water. Um, is going to hold water, is going to provide nutrition to our soil or to our plant, or has the potential to provide nutrition to our plant, and just have general kind of agronomic um, tilth of the soil. So, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about base saturation uh, right here. So the reason that basic people, a lot of people like to discuss base saturation is there's this quote-unquote ideal range of base saturation. This has been a, a, a established out of the Midwest and um, they, they did a survey and decided that this was kind of the ideal range that we want to see a soil in. So the ideal soil, quote unquote, is defined by um, that's calcium range and kind of 60-80% range, magnesium in 10 to 20%, potassium in 2 to 6%, and then sodium staying less than 2%, and hydrogen in this case to 10 to 15%. So um, so those are the ideal ranges. And what that ideal range is, is when we have a calcium number that's above 75%, I like to say, and we have magnesium kind of in that 15% or below, we end up with a well-flocculated soil. And we'll talk about what that means here a little bit more, as well as a soil that will you know, generally will plow pretty well and um, will overall um, take water and allow for percolation and things like that. Um, you can see here on these numbers, we got 50-50 you know, calcium magnesium with a little bit of this and that thrown in otherwise. Um, so this, this soil in particular is going to have, is going to have a very high, it has very high magnesium percentage and a very high sodium percentage. So both of those are going to indicate that we're going to have a very, very sticky soil. And even with sodium pushing up that high, we could have a moderately dispersed soil. So... Um, so that's kind of what we're allowed, we're able to do here is when we look at this, I can say that, okay, this high magnesium number means I have a sticky soil. It's going to hold water well. I know I don't want to go drive out there when it's wet because I'm going to slip all over the place and probably not get out of the field. And I'm also going to make sure that when I run my water, I'm going to try and have some type of calcium going out there to help, help build this. Now, what I just said there can be a little bit tricky, this whole building the soil and that's where a lot of people get into get into this um, get into a loop of well I'm at 46 percent I need to be at 75 percent so I'm going to start applying bulk calcium inputs to try and move that number and I'll be the first to tell you you can do that you can move that number however the challenge is that it functionally will not change the soil so let me say that again so you can functionally change this number. So if I go out there and apply several tons of gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, I will build my calcium number and dilute down my magnesium number, and I will hit that ideal range with enough money. However, that soil will not functionally change significantly. So the high magnesium will still be incredibly active out there, and you will still have a high magnesium soil. However, when you pull a soil test, the soil test will extract out that acid-soluble um, and that more extractable gypsum that you've applied or other calcium input, you could put lime out there too. You, it would work the same with lime. And you will, you will see that calcium number move. However, you will still have the same management issues that you have with this original soil. So 
Um, so that's, I just wanted to highlight that because we, one of the things we see, especially on, on ground that has had a lot of gypsum and lime applied to them, especially here in Ventura County, Old Berry Ground is notorious for this, where they, they've put out a lot of gypsum over the years. We'll get samples that look pretty good, but when you go and look at the sulfate numbers, the sulfate numbers are off the charts and they're really sticky and don't take water very well. And the reason for that is the tests are not bringing back realistic results because we have inputs in there that have diluted out the actual results of our, um, uh, that we that we need to see in, in the descriptive nature of our soils. So, um, so that's all I'll say about base saturation. So you can see it gets kind of convoluted and there's some ways to quote unquote beat the test, I'd like to say but it's not necessarily improving your management, um, your management options. So that's base saturation. So let's just run through this soil here now that we've kind of gone through the basics. So, and I've kind of dribbled in the, the details here as we've been going, but we'll go through and do the whole thing. So here's a soil, a soil report. We get this in, um, new block, we're wanting to do a new planting or whatever. Or, you know, if you're, if you're picked up a new lease and you're planting trees or planting some berries or something, you want to know what you're going to deal with. Um, and you know, okay, the, you know, we go out there, we look at it, we pull the sample, we go, oh yeah, this looks kind of dark, you know, it looks pretty heavy. Okay, we're gonna kind of, let's, let's figure out what that's gonna mean. And so here we go. So we, when we run through, we start off kind of with the summary statistics on the soil. We got a heavy soil, a CEC of 38.6. Organic matter is really high, which is great. That's what we wanna see. Um, we have a pH of 7.5, which is a pretty middle of the road pH. So we're not overly concerned about that. Um, we would be concerned if it was 8.5 or 9 or something like that or 4.2 or, you know, pretty far out of that 7 range. 7 is neutral. So anything in that kind of ideal range is like, you know, 6.5 up to 7.3, 7.5. So we're right in there. Um, so little solution weight, like I said, that's more of if we're going to do some calculations later, we can use that. Our soluble salts are 0.8, which is a good spot. It's not overly high. We get really concerned, especially on a heavy soil like this, if we have start seeing that EC bump above 2. Um, then we know we're going to have pretty significant salt burn and things like that, especially in salt sensitive crops like avocados or strawberries or something like that. Um, when we go down in the chemical extract, when I look at chemical extracts, I really like to look at this for what's missing. So um, you're going to see some things are high and some things are, uh, some things are very low. And that's really what we want to concentrate here is what's low or very low, because that means we're not going to have that in the soil. The soil is not, is definitely not going to provide that to our crop. So when we look at this soil, calcium is on the low side, potassium is on the low side, phosphorus surprisingly is on the low side, which is very odd for our soils here. This is a this is an oddity. And this is why we always pull soil tests because you never really know what's what's low. And then we see boron and nitrogen are also very low. So those are things that when we when we're in a production time where we know we need we know we need those nutrients. Oh sorry, I skipped over copper as well. That we know those we know we need those nutrients. For example, around bloom, we know this soil will not have any boron in it. And we know, presumably, that our water will not, and maybe that's different. We need to make sure during bloom, we put out boron. Or during early fruit development, we have calcium in our program. Or during fruit sizing, that potassium is provided. We're not super concerned about magnesium. We're not super concerned about sulfur and manganese and zinc and iron at this point. However, we need to make sure that they are sufficient in our tissue tests later, but they are down there in the soil, and we do have the potential to loosen those up and allow the plant to pull those out and mine those. Um, I did want to throw this, this back up here. John mentioned that um, soils are negatively charged. So overall, we have a, this, the charge of a soil is negative. That means our anions should leach out of our soil, and we should see those moving through. The anions are our nitrates, our chlorides, our sulfates are um, those. Okay, so that's our, that's our major our major anions that we're concerned with. Um, so, and then our cations, the things with positive charges, are calciums, or sodiums, or magnesiums, or potassiums those are going to stick around. Those aren't going to move with the water as much. So the reason I bring that up specifically now is when we go to a paste extract, um, this is a good spot to check and see what things are extremely excessive. Because that means that's things that are going to be very, very available right now and could be throwing off issues. In this case, we see that sodium is very high. And that's followed up with our base saturation is that it's also flirting with the high range in our base saturation on our chemical side. So this means that in this particular case, we'd want to definitely do something about our high sodium. Either that's dilute it out as a proportional input through adding in something else, whether that's calcium or more potassium or magnesium or something else, or um, try to leach it out. We go down also, we see that chlorides are very high as well. In this one, sulfur is okay. 
So when we see very high chlorides, that means we're having poor leaching because, or we have very high chlorides in our water. So that's kind of what we need to take into account both of those items. In this case, since we have a very heavy soil with that CEC at 38, we can say we probably have poor water movement because it's hard to move water through very heavy soils. And so that's probably where our chlorides are sticking around. So we wanna make sure that we address, uh, address that through increasing our ability to, to, to add some leaching factors to our irrigation and make sure that water is moving down. The high magnesium proportion or base saturation is also gonna influence our inability to leach soils. So that's, when we look at this base saturation, you can see we're pretty far off from that ideal. Here's when we would say, okay, we need to do something to make sure we move water, which is the point of our discussion today. So, and that's also why our sodium is sticking around. And presumably this is coming out of the Oxnard Plains, the water, and we have high sodium and chloride in there. So we need to do something about that. Okay. Many soil reports also throw in kind of a key opportunities or a, um, you know, a, a fertility schedule or some other things. So take all these with a grain of salt, obviously, and um, maybe literally in this case, and, um, and, and take a look at them, use them to inform your opinions, but also the goal here is hopefully to give you some, some ground to stand on when you can form your own opinions around your soil reports and kind of where you end up. In this case, it says potassium is a big deal as well as we need to look at our chloride issues. Um, which, which does show up and we discussed pretty well here. Um, and then calcium also shows up with soluble phosphorus being extremely low and something we should look at. So, okay, so that's kind of the basics of soils. What are they generally good for? I, I like to, here's kind of a couple points. You need, they're good to know what you're dealing with. They're good to identify nutritional deficits that need to be addressed in your fertility programs. We use them a lot to pinpoint problem spots and challenges. If you have, you know, 45 trees in the corner that look like hell, probably pull a soil report and see what's going on in that corner because sometimes soils all look the same, but they're chemically very different. Um, and then also, you know, troubleshoot issues in general because uh, kind of both of those at the end are kind of redundant to each other. They're not usually super expensive. We're talking 50 bucks a soil sample. Um, and then, um, you know, they can give you a lot of information about what the roots are dealing with and what your plant's trying to grow through um, to inform your management decisions. So that is soil reports. Um, I don't know why that blinked. Okay, um, I just want to throw this up because I know a lot of people use these fruit fruit grower labs um, uh, reports, and fruit growers does a phenomenal job with consistent results. So um, I think that that's great if you are getting these soil reports. Um, I wanted to throw this up. You can see here, this is nice. They have kind of a block comparison here against different sample areas, so you can really kind of get an idea of when you're trying to make management decisions across an entire ranch of you know which blocks are significantly different from other blocks. You can see here that we have PPM exchangeable K versus PP or versus milliequivalent soluble K. And so that is our paste versus chemical extract, which is, um, is, is kind of using different terminology here. And, um, and then down here on the bottom, you can see here's our base saturation numbers. We also have our CEC. There's a second page here that has the pH and other things like that listed that I didn't, I didn't pull in this presentation. But so same information is, um, is provided it's just, um, it's, it's here. So, and these are done as chemical extracts for the micronutrients. So, um, so same information you can see here on this specific example, and this is a much more typical soil for Ventura County that we have, you know, a nice, a nice amount of calcium in kind of that 70 to 80% range with, I know these numbers are really small, especially if you're on your phone, but with our magnesium kind of in that 15% range, our potassium is looking pretty sufficient. Our sodium is pretty low. And our hydrogen is also pretty low because this pH is probably like 7.4 here. So, um, so this is a very happy soil, which is why I didn't use this because it's not nearly as fun to talk about as the one that has all the challenges that we just talked about. So um, that is soil reports. Um, so let's jump into soil health. So let's kind of talk, let's, let's step away here from, from just the how do we read an analytical report and maybe get into some more of the farming, I like to say. Um, so when we approach soil health, which is really what, what we're looking at here when we're thinking, how are we gonna address our water chemistry? What are we gonna do for our soils? How are we gonna make all these management decisions? Kind of using those, those two different um, information sources to influence our, 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 key, our key decisions we're gonna make on inputs. Um, there's kind of these three things, that, you know, all those are, are being distilled down into this soil chemistry, soil biology, and plant physiology. Now today, because of our kind of our time restrictions, which I know doesn't seem like a time restriction with we're going on for an hour and a half here already, but um, we're gonna really concentrate on this soil chemistry. Now, but I did wanna mention, so uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this briefly here, 
is that soil biology is obviously extremely important in nutrient availability, as well as soil tilth and overall um, crop vigor. So um, that, that's very important. We have an additional webinar that I actually just threw up in the comment section here a little bit ago or in the Q&A section that you're welcome to go s s grab that link. Um, that we did a whole hour on soil biology and soil soluble carbon with um, Dr. DeCock from um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. A phenomenal discussion. I think there's a lot of insight there, especially if you're interested in soil biology, soluble carbon, compost, um, all those types of things, um, humic acids, things like that. So we did a deep dive into that. But I will mention here that we want to have a strong soil biology. Um, we want to make sure that we're not um, stressing that biology out to the point that we're start, we start to lose that because it does provide a very valuable tool to our, to our farming practices and allowing for nutrient availability and nutrient cycling within the soil. Um, and then plant physiology. Plants do a lot more to the soil than just suck things out of it. They put a lot back into it as well, up to um, a, a, a vast majority of our photosynthates that the, and sugars that the plant uh, actually produces can be, can be sent down into the roots to help with nutrient extraction in the soil. So, and that helps to build the soil over time. So we wanna make sure that we have a strong, healthy crop um, and that will, and root system, and that will in turn have a positive feedback loop to help build out our healthy soil. So let's jump into soil chemistry and kind of how that functionally, functionally works. So we have um, soil cation imbalances. So imbalances of cation could lead to degradation of soil colloids and soil structure. As you can see there, and that's actually, there's Jared's hand there holding a beautiful, a beautiful chunk of soil. And we've all done that where you pick up a chunk of soil and it just kind of falls apart beautifully in our hand. We still see those colloid formations and um, it's not just a rock in our hand. Um, and, and that can be, you know, that can be a very gratifying thing. We have a well hydrated, um, beautiful soil tilth that we're farming. And I think that's a very nice thing. But when we start things getting out of, out of whack, um, and that can be our cation ratios, then we start to see, um, start to see, start to see issues. So I have a question here. How far apart should testing be from a representative profile of your soil? Is there a rule of thumb, for example, in a one acre block, how many samples are recommended? So there's a lot of different schools of thought out there um, and on kind of how many soil samples you should pull. And you can go crazy on soil samples and pull as many as you'd like. Um, but uh, my general recommendation is pull soil samples to represent your management um, capabilities. So if you have a 40 acre block that's all gonna be managed the same, you should probably pull a representative sample of that 40 acre block so you can do it all the same. Now that, if you have some areas that are notably different, you probably want to pull something different. But overall, that has been the best, um, the, the best results I've seen because functionally, when it comes down to it, you're going to get this soil report and you are going to either put something through your irrigation system or spray something on or not do anything. And you need to figure out kind of what um, spatial um, uh, resolution you need on that. So it's really going to depend on your operation and your ability to modify your irrigation system or other things. Now, if you're doing a new ranch install, for example, and you're, I know there's a lot of guys putting in, putting in orchards in the hills, in the hillsides, and there's a lot of variability in soils. Ideally, you would be able to kind of track each one of your management blocks along with your soil type so you can individually manage those. That's not always capable. And I know there's a lot of people with avocado orchards right now laughing at me. And I understand that that is a huge challenge because some of you have blocks that have CECs ranging from beach sand to heavy clays, and that can be a nightmare to manage. But when you're pulling these soil samples, once again, you're going to want to pull maybe from the super heavy, from the super low, and something in between. And then you're going to figure out, okay, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do that. So, um, so great. Another question here from Chris. Uh, my soil has optimal levels of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and manganese, but the leaf tissue samples for my gold nugget tangerines and Valencia oranges are almost always on the low in these nutrients. What can I do to unlock these nutrients for uptake into my trees? Thanks, Chris. Um, so the, uh, I think we're gonna address some of that here. So I'm actually, let me come back to that question because um, I think it's a really good question, but let me come back to it because I think it deserves a longer answer than what we have time for right now. Um, so let me, I'm gonna leave that up here so it reminds me and I, we're, we're, we'll come back to that, okay? So thanks, Chris. Okay, so soil cation imbalances um, is what we're talking about. So what that, 
what that looks like, John had this had this slide up there before, and you know we need to remember that uh, that our roots are living in in the soil and interacting with that soil quite a bit. And when we have a soil that has imbalanced ions, and that means too much salt or too many anions or too much hydrogen or and something like that. And we'll go into a couple of those situations here and look at them more closely. That the soil chemistry, the soil structure starts to break down. We have poor soil structure, poor colloid formation. We can get compression. We can get um, we can get hard pans, chemical hard pans forming in the soil, and um, dispersion of the soil structure. And all of that will lead to poor conditions for the roots, anoxic zones, and poor water movement. So, um, it, so all of those are obviously things we're trying to avoid. And um, the idea is we have a well aggregated soil with good defined micropore and macropore space, and that allows for proper water movement and root growth. So let's, let's and John touched on these a little bit, but we're gonna go through them again. So the, um, the ideal situation is that we have um, well defined micropore space with calcium keeping that open and making, and making sure we have flocculated soils with minimal amounts of sodium causing, causing issues. We do need to have a little bit of sodium, but generally we always have too much, so that's not really of a practical concern. And then you know magnesium as well being present. The, we talked about this at length in that we have these negative, negatively charged soil particles, and then the positive cations are functioning to actually chemically, you can think of them to loosely glue the soil together or hold it together. And calcium does a phenomenal job at this of holding the soil together in a positive way that roots like and that water likes to move through it in a chemical in a chemicals in the chemical way. And then the negative cations are flowing through the soil, which is why we um, see things like nitrate leaving the root zone. We can have a discussion about that later if people would like. Um, so a well flocculated soil has this nice amount of calcium that holds the soil together and also open at the same time so that we have good water movement, good air water relations. A compact soil or a tight soil, as a lot of us refer to them in the, in the or sticky, um, would be a higher magnesium soil. And that's when we're, you know, our, our base saturation magnesium is pushing over that 25, 20, 30% mark, as we saw in our earlier example, 45%. That's one of those fields you walk out and you come back four inches taller and you have to hose out your truck rims when you're done driving through it because you've got so much mud stuck to your, stuck to your wheels, they won't go straight. So, um, so that's what it looks like when you have a compacted soil. And what that means is it's so tight that the water has a hard time staying in it and we don't get good even hydration of that micropore space and the roots have a hard time. Also on these high mag soils, we tend to see that when they dry down, they turn into rocks and so roots do not like to live in rocks. So um, into um, and super tight soil. So that can be extremely stressful on our root systems. So generally we try to keep them a little bit more on the moist side and they don't like to move water. So we have a very big challenge there trying to go on the teeter-totter between not keeping them too wet but also not getting them too dry that our roots are stressed out but we still have enough oxygen getting down in there so um, so soil chemistry so what are we what do we do here the answer is really um, adequate levels of ionic calcium will lead to improved soil structure and colloid formation over time um, inadequate soluble carbon feeds directly into this as well we have low soluble carbon in the soil, we don't have a happy microbial community, and that in turn will lead to poor soil conditions. The microbes in the soil um, serve many different functions, most notably is nutrient, is nutrient release, but also production of carbonic acids and other acids to help with, uh, help with nutrient release, including calcium, and also forming um, soil colloids in and of themselves to their through their, um, through their life cycle. So they will help glue the, you think of gluing the soil together and helping to maintain structure for our roots. Um, there's a lot of beneficial microbes that have relationships with the root system as well that will help to push the roots um, and build that soil also. Um, so the goal here is to make sure that we have soluble carbon um, in, the, in the system so that that soil can be alive and well and fed so that it will continue to provide those nutrients. So getting back to Chris's question of what do I do to get nutrition out of my soil and into my, into my crop, we need to make sure we have a strong, healthy root system, but we also need to include soluble carbon into our fertility plans to make sure that we can feed those microbes that will then feed our plants. So um, there's a lot of native nutrition, as Chris pointed out, in that soil, um, and it's not always readily available because of poor uh, 
poor chemical availability of soluble of nutrients and them being insoluble. So they're sitting in that chemical side, you know, in that left-hand column, they're sitting on that chemical side, really wishing they could be in that paste side so the plant could take them up. But the only way to get them from the insoluble to the soluble is through the through the actions of our um, of the root itself and the plant physically or not physically but chemically mining out the soil and are also our microorganisms physically and chemically mining out those nutrients out of the soil and um, and then them cycling through um, through uh, decomposition and availability for that plant. Okay, so intercalic soluble carbon, the solution, soluble carbon. We put soluble carbon in the system, we get that. Um, short, medium, long chain carbon compounds are critical to soil structure and soil functioning. So um, when we say soluble carbon, that's different than just carbon, right? So I just wanna highlight that here is that um, soluble carbon is carbon that is in a size class that's small enough and also digestible enough for the soil microbes to use. Um, so there's a lot of, you can think uh, charcoal is also carbon, but charcoal is inert. So um, you can have a lot of charcoal out there. It won't do a whole lot. Um, for nutritional availability, it will do a whole lot for, um, it can do, I should say, it can do a whole lot for um, aerating the soil and a whole lot of physical properties. But in terms of nutrient availability, it's going to have a hard time feeding the soil, which is what we're talking about here. Um, likewise, sticks and leaves and things like that, macro carbon, as I'll call it, large chunks of carbon in the soil are also not what we're going for here. We're going for this soluble, soluble size class of carbon. That's fulvic acids, long chain carbons, humic acids, things like that, that will help with nutrient availability. Okay. So nutrient levels and ratios, inadequate levels of um, soluble nutrients within the soil profile will lead to reduced plant health and plant growth. So if we have, uh, if we have poor nutrient availability, our roots won't grow, our plant won't grow, and this will lead to poor soil health. Um, the solution there is kind of a combination of everything we just talked about. Make sure we have good calcium nutrition, make sure we have soluble carbon to, to grow, and then also pick up for the rest of our rest of our fertility, excuse me, rest of our fertility inputs to make sure that we we have a uh, uh, a nutrition uh, a crop that is nutritionally sufficient that will continue to grow and and, um, and thrive in the soil as we have as that crop will help build the soil as well. Um, Lastly, on soil chemistry, salinity. Uh, we can have excessive salinity, and um, notably in salinity, we're talking about sodium will lead to deflocculation of the soil colloid and reduced water and air movement. So let's talk about that briefly here. So we've seen this flocculated, happy soil, lots of calcium. We like that. Um, when we get sodium, sodium is a monovalent cation, meaning it has one positive charge, and so it will dis it will um, displace calcium on the soil colloid when it gets at high levels and it will functionally rip apart that glue that we have from calcium holding the soil together happily and it will disperse the soil so it will make it so those colloids fall apart and become compact and we call it a dispersed soil and it won't take water and the catch-22 however is that the way we get rid of sodium is we move water through the soil along with calcium and um, we can't do that because the soil is compacted and won't take the water. So it's a very, can be a very challenging situation to dig out of. Um, and then high ECs can perform, can do very similar things where we have a very high EC soil will lead to reduced bioactivity of the soil, reduced plant growth, compaction, and other issues. So overall, the goal there is that we have our soil, we like to move water through our soil, and as we move water through our soil, we need that water to move into the micropore space, which is where the roots live. And so the problem is if that micropore space is, is either compacted or chemically unavailable or otherwise um, not ideal, one, we won't have good root growth because roots actually live in thin film of water that's held in that micropore space. Um, and if we can't get the water to penetrate in that micropore space, we won't be able to hold, we won't be able to move our water to actually where our roots need it. And we'll end up just running the water straight through. You can think of this in terms of like a, sand, a sandier soil where we, where we run water, run water, run water, and then we have no water left when we're done watering because it's all just run down below and run through the root zone. Um, so this, is, this can be a, a major issue, especially on lighter ground, but it can happen on heavier ground too when we have poor colloid formation and poor soil tilt. So the goal here is when we water that the 
uh, water penetrates into the into the into the micropore space, evenly hydrates the soil, and also continues to flow out through that macropore space because those are equally important to have a little bit of both because we do want that soil to drain so that we end up with a well oxygenated soil over time. Okay, so soil surfactants. Sean mentioned mentioned these, so I'm not going to beat him to death here, but the uh, the goal is breaking water surface tension, which allows that water droplet to penetrate into those smaller micropore spaces, um, which can be uh, really a, a great technology to utilize here. So really getting the water to move. Um, so the, 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 the challenge here for moving, for fixing salinity issues, really soil surfactants can come in and really improve our ability to leach soils, even when we have some deflocculation and, um, and can be a challenge to get water into them appropriately. So um, all of these kind of all these facets feed back into the soil chemistry and soil health in general where we're looking for a well aggregated soil with good micropore and macropore space um, with flocculated soils and all of that will equal a stronger healthier root zone. Okay so we're going to jump now into some products some input options um, that can help kind of improve these facets of your of of your orchard or your of your crop ground and um, and and kind of address some of these key these key um, limiting factors that we've discussed throughout today's presentation. So we'll discuss three of them: um, mainstay calcium, Penical, and H eighty five. Got another question? I only see one slide from Jeffrey. Um, yeah, so I. Jeffrey, let me know if there's a if you if you're still having an issue, and maybe Sam can Sam can help you out. Um, so these three these three products I'm going to talk about. We've got um, we've got H85 to start. I want to start this start this off. Um, H85 is a humic acid product that increases microbial diversity. It's 15% potassium with 42% humic acid. It's a dry currently, and we're working on some liquid formulations coming out next year. Um, Improves microbial diversity in soil health, improves synthetic nitrogen efficiency. It's also soluble across a broad range of pHs, which is a very beneficial attribute, especially with some of our higher pH soils that we have here. Um, so H85, I'm not gonna talk at, at length really about H85 and its merits, other than that it does help feed the soil and um, is a phenomenal product to help um, increase microbial diversity through its long chain carbon content that we include in there. It helps feed some of those beneficial fungal communities in our soil and can be used at fairly low rates of maybe a half pound to a pound for this type per you know, two month period or something like that um, for, this, for this discussion for soil health and water management. So this is, a, this is H85 in this context is really being used for um, building soil tilt over time and feeding our soil microbial community. Um, it is available in an organic form. In organics, we also see it helping dramatically with nutrient availability, and we've documented that, and we've talked about that in other webinars. If you're interested, we can talk about that more later. Um, you can contact me, and we'll, we can we can discuss it. But for nutrient availability, as we discussed, the whole reason we want those microbes down there is to help with nutrient availability to get some of that um, get some of that tied up nutrition from our soil into our plants. So. Um, Sorry, I'm just clicking through some menus here. So mainstay calcium is one that I'll, I'll present here and then we'll talk about a little bit in, in terms of organics. So it's a, it helps to build soil structure. It's a 20% calcium. It increases soil flocculation, increases water movement, and improves root growth. It's also a phenomenal calcium nutrient. Um, it uses our uh, microencapsulation technology that limits tie up. So we can even add this in with some phosphorus containing products and have um, available calcium going out to the root zone um, to help with root growth, water movement, and soil flocculation. Um, this has been incredibly helpful on the organic side because we, we brought this product in the organic market last year and we've seen great results on organics increasing, increasing water movement in a, in a very timely way. Um, another nice thing is this can be hooked up on a, on a metering type system where we think of where we've done a lot on conventional uh, or we do with gypsum or something like that. This product's a liquid and can be uh, metered into our, into our irrigation very effectively and can have very positive results for moving salt. So if you have high salt issues on a salt sensitive crop, um, mainstay calcium organic can be a great tool to help remedy those issues. 
um, also great for, for fruit firmness and things like that. So um, Penical is one I wanted to jump into some field examples with. And Penical has the same calcium technology as our mainstay calcium at 10% instead of 22, but we threw in a, uh, a hefty dose of soil surfactant. And we've used a, a um, special combination of surfactants to really maximize its duration, its, its life, its life, its lot, its utility in the soil. It's, sorry, I'm having a hard time getting that out here for how long it's effective in the soil, and then also make sure that we're able to, in, to help with, with leaching as well as water retention. So both of those seem, seem opposite, but we've managed to do that. So, um, so it improves micropore structure, improves water movement through the soil profile, and also helps to improve air-water relations. So let's talk about that in a field example. So here's a strawberry field late season, um, and uh, this is a pretty common site. Um, strawberries, if you're not familiar, are irrigated through drip under the plastic. There's two lines of drip running down, uh, two, or two to three lines, depending on the grower, of drip running down the top of the bed that's just sat there um, in between the plant lines. And you can see in the furrow that we're starting to see these puddles form. And so what's happening is the irrigation water is running and it's not getting down into the root zone. It's running through either cracks in the soil or just right off the top of the bed, down, out the sh down through the shoulder, off the shoulders and into the furrow. So we pull back the plastic a little bit and you can see that we're not getting even hydration of the bed. It's really kind of seeping out through this one area. We're not getting our water where we need it to be in the root zone. So this can be a real challenge, especially in berry production, but also in vegetables and, and um, drip, irrigated, drip irrigated permanent crops. We see this a lot in lemons and other and avocados and things where we have the just poor water movement away from drip lines, whether it's all going down too fast or it's just not going, it's, we're not getting even hydration throughout the root zone. And that's where something like a product like Penacal has been very effective. So um, we ran this trial on um, Penacal versus solution grade gypsum. Um, this was done in the Central Valley where gypsum actually is, in many, in many cases, is a very good input. However, um, it, let's take a look at the results, I guess. So we did this across multiple sites, I think about 25 sites that we ran this trial on, comparing Penacal treated blocks versus, at scale, versus gypsum treated blocks across a very large grower in the Central Valley. And it was a very simple program where we did a half gallon of Penacal at the start, of the season followed by a quart every 45 days. So first irrigation, half a gallon, then a quart 45 days for a total of a gallon per acre over the season and um, over the summer, or oh, sorry, over the year. So that was compared to a very aggressive, agronomically correct solution grade gypsum program that was dosed in with every irrigation through an auto feed system. And then we just simply came in and took penetrometer readings during irrigation cycles to kind of see where our irrigation water was ending up. So that's where these pictures came from that we saw earlier that John presented where you can see that we have uh, highly saturated soil and you know down to about five inches, four and three to five inches, and then it's pretty much dry below that um, just because of poor water movement within the soil. And what we saw with our composite data overall, so these are looking at average averages across, you can see the blue line there in the middle, that's uh, 300 PSI. That's what UC tells us is um, where roots do no longer like to grow. Um, so above 300 PSI is hard, and you can think of in this case as not wet also. And then we have there, we have the red line is the gypsum, the gypsum program. And you can see we have, as in the picture, we have water penetration down about four inches. And above that, um, the, soil, the soil becomes very hard and very firm. So we have poor water movement down to that depth. Whereas with the, the, in the composite Penacal blocks, we saw that we had good water movement even down to 18 inches. So we were able to um, have a more efficient irrigation cycle. Now what that means is that we are able to run irrigation for a shorter duration, right? Because we're able to get that water to run through the root zone and hydrate it more efficiently. So we don't need to run as long of an irrigation set, which on a lot of, I know a lot of people are on set um, durations of water availability that can be very beneficial. And of course, uh, many people now are on uh, water rationing. So being able to run shorter sets and not have to compensate for runoff or for evaporation or for um, things of that nature can be very beneficial to the bottom line. Speaking of the bottom line, cost is always a concern um, for input selection. And the two programs here, um, Penacal not only performed better, but actually saved a significant amount of money over the gypsum program. And this is just product cost. Um, you'd have to also throw into here labor cost and infrastructure cost, whereas Penacal is injected three times, we have a gypsum system 
and um, and agitation system for hydration and or not hydration, but solu solubilizing in injection. So, um, so a kind of a nice a nice option. I like this picture. Um, that's 30 acres worth of Penical on top of about the same amount of gypsum. So, um, I I've, I've thrown a few gypsum bags around in my life, and the two and a halfs of Penical are heavy, but they're not uh, they're not 100 pounds. So. Um, so I'll leave you with that for that kind of that option. So water penetration for Penacal, we're looking at, at rates. A quart per acre um, is generally our standard every 30 to 45 days. A lot of people have a quart per acre every month. That's just their standard. Um, it's easy to remember that the 15th of the month, we always go put a quart of Penacal out on that week's irrigation cycles, and that allows us to maintain water movement. A lot of people in Ventura County don't start with these applications until June or July. Um, because that's when we've been irrigating long enough that we start to see water penetration issues. On the berries, however, we like to see it kind of from the beginning at about a quart per month or something like that. Um, we also see a lot of good application in um, row crops um, where we see seed line sprays, um, a pint to a quart, even up to a half gallon on that seed line spray can be very effective, get a very high concentration. Um, it's also compatible with most herbicides, so you can do a spray down application if you're going out and doing a an herbicide spray job, you can put this on to help get the rainwater in better or to help get um, irrigation water in. And then chloride leaching in general, um, we can go up to even up to a gallon and a half if we have a major chloride issue where we just really need to blow some water through, we can really crank up the, the, the Penacal to get it going. We've seen great results with this product in lemon blocks, um, old lemon blocks that just aren't doing that well, the water's not going in the ground that great, we can't run our irrigation sets as long as we'd like, so we can't get our deep water. And um, we've seen great results with Penacal allowing for that soil to open up a little bit, get those 24 hour sets running a little bit, a little bit better and getting a lot less um, tailwaters coming off the bottom of the property. Um, so this has been a very valuable tool. So we start there the half gallon and then we'll back that down from there. Um, that's all conventional. So I know I've got a couple organic guys on the call. So I wanted to throw in kind of how mainstay calcium organic can fit in. We already mentioned that it can be a very powerful tool for increasing water movement I wanted to show you an example of some blueberries that we had this year where um, I kind of alluded to earlier where we had some over acidification of the soil and that, and that caused some compaction. And then similar to what we saw in that almond block where we saw that over hydration of the, of the top couple inches of soil, same thing happened in the blueberry block. And we ended up having mucky, mucky soil underneath the, underneath the weed cloth that just really wasn't moving water. And we had a lot of root stress and really kind of a stressed out canopy. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So we did a pre and post um, kind of conglomerate of um, soil penetration force. And this was done by Holden Research and Consulting, and he uh, and he and he measured that we saw about a uh, a twenty five percent drop or so in um, in overall penetration force um, needed to kind of which is indicating you know better soil tilt, which is, which in turn resulted you know this twenty two to twenty six percent reduction in soil and soil firmness resulted in um, much better leaching of salts, much better delivery of nutrition and nutrition availability. That's a big deal. This is, like I said, organic blueberries. So nutritional availability is a big deal. And that better water movement, better soil, air, air water relations, and better uh, uh, just overall soil health allowed for really a bumper crop year from a year that looked like it was going to be a nightmare. Um, poor poor early season, shoot elongation, a lot of tip burn, scant canopies, blooms were being aborted from salt issues and just overall stressed out root zone, not getting enough water. And we were able to fix that with a half gallon um, every two weeks in this uh, blueberry block and that turned it around. So really a pretty powerful, a powerful tool there in organics. So key concepts for today, uh, we're gonna kind of sum it up here. We're getting close to our end of the time here. We've got if you want a textbook, if you're more of a, if you, if you like to learn by reading, um, Western Fertilizer Handbook covers most of what we talked about today. Um, if you want the basics on soil tests and water tests and ratios and calculations, this is the, this is the go-to. Um, water tests can provide some phenomenal insight into your water and how to, how, to, how to use it, as well as what you can do to fix it if it needs fixing or is fixable. Um, and then soil tests in the same way can really help provide some insight into how to, how to manage your soils best. Uh, we want to always focus on soil biology and make sure our, sure our bi biology is helping us and not, uh, not hindering us. I say that because if we have poor soil biology, poor soil conditions, that can lead to pathogen issues 
um, when we have anoxic and root stress roots. So if we have a healthy root system and a healthy soil, that will lead to an overall better soil. Um, I'll throw this picture back up there. The Penical is really the evolution of technology um, for increasing soil water movement. Um, gypsum was a great product and it, and it was, and it had, its, it had its problems. The biggest one being it doesn't work well in high EC situations, which is what we have for most of our water in Ventura County, which is the majority of the listeners today. Um, so it's rarely, um, rarely the best input to choose in, um, unless you have, for some reason, you've got that perfect well, that magic well that's got very low EC water, and um, you need to have a little bit extra calcium. Uh, where's Penafil can be a great tool. I've got a question here from Richard. Richard's asking, what is the recommended rate per acre of Penical for avocado orchards with clay soils? So generally we start with a half gallon and then we'll go to a quart on that 30 to 45 day interval is our, is our goal. Okay. Um, also, we just talked about the merits of this organic mainstay calcium organic product is really a great product. And um, I didn't mention this, but a lot of the organic calciums that are on the market are lime based and they're really pH dependent for their availability. And um, that's one key here for, um, for mainstay calcium organic is that it's not, we've already done that step for you. It's available right now. You put it out, you're going to see impact on your fruit quality and soil water movement um, right away. And it's not going to require you to have some type of acid input to, to loosen it up like it would with a lime based um, calcium carbonate based product. So um, with that, I hope we helped, um, I, hope, I hope we communicated our, our uh, passion and excitement in growing plants and hope to give you some new tools to help feed your, um, your, 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 uh, your farm and um, move your production forward. Um, I did wanna say thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, we do have demonstration product available. So if you are interested in Penical or Mainstay Calcium Organic, on uh, trying it out on your ranch, um, give me a call. I'll put my contact information up here in a slide or two, um, and we can we can talk about that and get you some meaningful um, sample product to make sure that you can get a look at it, see if it's what you like. Um, the uh, the all the tools we talked about today are our local distributors, Agrex. Um, so it's available from them. Call your local your your, your uh, PCA or your your salesman there at Agrex, and they'll be able to answer your questions and give you more feedback. Um, a lot of the tools we discussed today are day-to-day -day normal tools that we're using in orchards all over Ventura County and I really appreciate the interactions we have with Agrex bringing in some local knowledge that we're able to share with you today. Um, so um, that's that. So here's my info and John's as well. Um, if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me. My cell number, my email address as well is there on the screen and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions on a personal note or come out and take a look at your ranch. Um, and help you out there. Um, I will also uh, throw this up there. If you do need CCA hours, snap a picture of that um, QR code right there, or use your app, and that'll get you your two hours of soil and water um, continuing education units. And I'm gonna leave that up there for a minute here while everybody scrambles to find their app. I'll also send this out in a follow-up email. We'll have the office send it out to you so that you've got the sign-in sheet so you can do it. Uh, but with that, I wanted to open it up to more questions. I really appreciate the ones we did get. Um, and maybe while we're, while people are working on getting those in, um, you can, like I said, send them to the Q&A or the chat box. We'll, we'll, we'll work on answering them either way. Um, that is the end of the presentation that I have for today. Uh, I really, like I said, once again, thank you so much for, for logging on and sticking around with us. Um, I did have a couple questions here that kind of trickled in. I had one that got text to me. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get those, get those going through here. Um, I got a hand up. Okay. So, all right. So my question, so one that comes up a lot and has been used a lot is, um, is, is something like this. So it goes, I, I have a, I, I use calcium thiosulfate and is that the same as mainstay or Penical? And maybe let me let John kind of mention this because it's usually cats is getting used more as a water treatment is what it's being billed as. And I, I think that maybe John might have some insight there to kind of how calcium thiosulfate might fit in on kind of a water treatment option. Sure. Um, again, like, uh, like many inputs, calcium thiosulfate 
can be a, a tremendous uh, tool. And the, the circumstance where calcium thiosulfate is most beneficial is where you have moderate to low salinity and high free lime. Now, why is why the low to moderate salinity? Calcium thiosulfate, the thiosol molecule, is a, a great tool, but it's it's got a high salinity index. So if you're already very high in sulfate sulfur uh, or high EC, you want to be careful with that. Um, the um, it has elemental sulfur in it, so it's it's going to it's going to form sulfuric acid in the soil. So a perfect fit for that product is where you have free lime, you have lime in that soil, moderate low salinity, that it's a great tool. Okay, again, uh, as a as a water to try to to balance cations with more calcium, um, if it if it meets the salinity and the free lime criteria, that can be beneficial. However, keep in mind that that moderate levels of thiosol molecule are, are fantastic. High levels are not. Um, so we, so that's the that's the fit and where where it is a good fit, fantastic tool. Yeah, so I, um, I think that's one of the things we see here a lot with with calcium thiosulfate is we have a lot of blocks that are that do have high lime soils. However, we also have very high sulfates and very high ECs at the same time. So that can be a big challenge to try and figure out which problem there we want to high, we want to concentrate on. Um, yeah, you know, and I think I, I think besides a water test and a soil test, what I highly recommend in those circumstances is go to your Typically, it's going to be a drip emitter. Actually, take a plug of soil and have a bottle of apple cider vinegar with you. Now, the reason why is what is vinegar? It's acetic acid. And what you do is, especially if the, if the soil is a little more on the drier side, you pour that out. You get a really strong response, a fizzing. What that is, the acetic acid reacting with calcium carbonate, typically, and you're getting that CO2 uh, release. That's where that's where the thiosol molecule is going to shine is where you have, you have something to react with. And so you want to look. So sometimes, you know, maybe the top three inches, you get no reaction at all, but you get down to, you know, 48 inches and you get a very strong reaction. So you want to make sure you have a good reaction. A soil and water test will offer great perspective on that. But again, a visual on-site uh, look is, is very important. Great. I've um, got a question here, um, functionally here. So um, do I have to do anything for the VCALG credit? I got another one, how do, you, how do you get credit for the VCALG? So when you signed up for this, you, you put in your VCALG numbers and all the information that we need. So Zoom will stick out, will spit out a report that says you were here and we will send that over to Jody in the office and she will make sure to get you all recorded. Um, so you're all good. We don't need to have any additional information from you other than your presence. And then um, we will we'll get that over to her in the next day and um, or to this afternoon, I guess, and she'll have that information. Then she'll contact you if she has any follow-up questions or something you didn't get your VCALC number in properly or something like that. I saw some people got most of the information, but not all of it. So we'll we'll leave that in her capable hands to work with you guys on that. Um, so but we will we'll have that. So um, okay. Where's my mouse? Okay. Great. Okay, so that's that's the VCAL credit. Okay, let's see. Do we have any other questions trickling here? I get a question a lot. You know, um, uh, you know, you know, something like this. So I, I grow celery, which is very salt tolerant. Would Penical help? Um, I think that um, a lot of the times we salt tolerance and then the ability of the crop to thrive under salt conditions can be a two very different things, right? So um, if, if we're looking at, you know, maybe a crop that's not performing as well as we want, even though we have a salt tolerant crop, it can be a very big challenge. Now it was brought up earlier, putting out, um, putting out, um, putting out Penical in avocados. Obviously avocados are not a salt tolerant crop and that's somewhere where it can be a very good, a very good option to help move those chlorides and sulfates and sodium through the, through the soil profile. Um, 
Okay. I got a question here from Richard. Does fruit growers carry Panacal? Fruit growers does not, but Agrix would be able to take care of you and they've got the shop there in Fillmore or, or Oxnard. So, um, or you can contact me and I can put you in contact with somebody that can help you out. Um, yeah, so uh, going back to water chemistry, you know, it's uh, here's, here's one. I, I have hundreds of pounds of calcium in my water. Should I add more? I think we kind of talked about that a little bit, but John, maybe, maybe like, can we kind of talk about that a little bit, I guess, because that, that's a concept that I sometimes have issues with. Sure. Uh, you're going to love my response. It depends. It, it, it really, uh, the, the calcium in the water is beneficial, but what else do you have? Do you, do you have high sulfate, high bicarbonate? Um, to what effect is it impeding the, the performance of that calcium in the water? Water analysis and Better yet, water and soil analysis really tell a, tells a story as to um, if and when additional calcium would be merited. Okay. So, I uh, also got, what about high boron in soils and water? Um, John, why don't you go ahead and take that one too? Yeah, uh, the, the, there's two things, two things that are very important with high, high boron in water. First, boron will leach and so it's it's imperative you have good water movement uh, you have a good leaching that does not accumulate the second one of the one of the keys from a plant standpoint to minimize boron toxicity is have excellent calcium nutrition yeah so we see that I see this a lot in um, there's kind of some some seasonal dynamics on boron right so this time of year High boron is a big deal in several growing regions here in Ventura County. It's a couple of the canyons I'm thinking good enough. I'm thinking some Barsdale. Um, some of the areas over in Moore Park have some high boron issues, and that can be that can be very bad at the end of the season. Now, as John just mentioned, it's also leachable, right? So boron is incredibly important at a, kind of two key timings in crop development. We have pollination, where it, where it's very helpful in pollen tube formation and overall pollination. So we want to make sure we have sufficient boron during times of pollination, but then we also need it in early fruit development as well. So both of those timings are early season uh, timings. Now, because we have high boron in the fall does not mean we necessarily have boron in the winter or the early spring. So that's a time that we, that there's some seasonal dynamics there that we can have a time of year where it's incredibly It'd be ridiculous to recommend boron in September in uh, on a grower on good, up on a good enough water district, but it would be um, it would you would you have potential to lose yield by not having actually putting on a little bit of boron in your early spring bloom applications. So um, so that so water movement boron and chloride you can kind of think of them the same. If we have too much boron, we need to increase water movement. Penacal, mainstay calcium, H eighty five all those relevant relevant inputs for the discussion. Thanks, Bob. Um, reviewing here. So yeah, so um, another, another really common one. Oh, here we have an, another one. I think I missed your comment on credit. Am I supposed to fill out a form no, so um, so for credit, you should have put in your information when you RCP'd for this webinar, and we have it all. So we'll send that over to Jody, and Jody at the office will get it taken care of. Um, if not, uh, you can contact them directly, and they'll be able to make sure that you get credit for it because we'll have a there's Zoom produces a report with your name and everything that we'll send over to them to make sure that they know you are here. So um, yeah, so. Um, the, the question is, so I have high sulfate and chlorides in my water. What should I do? Um, really, that's a water movement issue. So going back to that soil sample that we had um, or or the, the this particular question that just my water comes with a lot of chlorides and sulfates, you're going to, you have to water, right? And a lot of people are stuck with the water that they have and you're not going to put an RO system. You don't have any option for blending, which is also an old way to kind of work that out in some areas where you can blend. Um, different water sources to to try and get a, a more 
amenable water source that has a better better uh, ratios. But really, you can water with high sulfate and chloride water. You just need to make sure that you have a significant leaching factor that is moving that through the soil and not building it up. It becomes very challenging if you have a very heavy soil, but it can be done, and it just has to make sure that you know that water movement is taken into account, and that is mulching. You mix in your program, Penical helping with soil water movement, you know, maybe mainstay calcium's in there as well. So there's tactics that can be taken to overcome some of these marginal water issues, but there's still a potential for buildup in the long run. Um, hi, can you please tell me how to get credit for VCALG? Okay, so um, oh, I already answered that one. Sorry, that was, it didn't scroll. Um, okay. Okay, sorry, I had a new one pop up, but it was uh, it was the same. Oh, is Jody here? So, if anyone has questions about whether they received VCAL credit, um, feel free to email me at Jody at FarmBureauVC.com, and that's in the chat, so you can see everyone can see that. If you want to grab her email address in the chat function, there, you're welcome to to work with Jody, and she's great. She'll get it get it figured out for you. So, and we'll send over this attendee report here in the next. Uh, we should have that in the next hour that Zoom's able to spit that out for us. Um, does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to send in here? I've got, um, that's kind of the majority of my discussion. I think that, I hope, um, yeah, I hope you found this useful. We're always looking for feedback. So if, um, if you've got some feedback you'd like to send over to us, please let us know. Um, and we will have this recorded for those of you that maybe missed part of it or had to step out for part of it, you're welcome to go back. We'll send you all out a follow-up email that will uh, we'll have it recorded on YouTube. So you're welcome to take it, share it, watch it again. I don't know, put it in with the home videos um, and, uh, and use it for trainings, whatever you want. So it'll be on our YouTube page. We have lots of other great content there. Um, we've done one of these on soil health, as I mentioned before. We've done them on calcium and phosphorus and you know planting and that just, uh, we've got a bunch of great content over there in a similar format to this talking about how different nutrients and other other agronomic principles can play into your into your role to look this up redox bionutrients on uh, YouTube um, we're always adding more content and then we'll also let you know if we have any more webinars or if and when we have more webinars coming up that are relevant we'll uh, we'll make sure to get you uh, drop you a, a quick note that you're welcome to join us and um, and learn, hopefully learn along with us and help to inform the conversation. So um, if anybody's got any additional questions, I'm happy, I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit. Um, and um, we can we can keep, yeah, I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit as people might trickle in with some more more questions, but I think uh, that was that was all I got. So thanks again.